last uh, lecture, uh, three points that came from you and one from you and for you, uh, and, and one point that came up uh, for me, and I would like to start with that. I think that the most important element, most important capacity required for intellectual life is patience. There's a very, very good reason for that. And the reason is that um, a major part of intellectual life is about judgment, the judgment of ideas. And uh, before you can judge, uh, you have to be able to understand the idea. If you judge on the basis of a misunderstanding, you've done nothing, you've actually done uh, wrong. Uh, some of the people who were there, who were here uh, last week and are here uh, today, um, have shown a, a pretty incredible uh, level of impatience uh, for my own uh, taste. Um, and I think there's something almost unintellectual in this uh, uh, level of, uh, of impatience. When I started the, 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 the lecture, I said, this is going to take six lectures. Uh, why is it going to take six lectures? Not just because I like to talk a lot, but because there's a lot of material that I have to cover. Um, I do not expect anybody in any way to agree with me. Uh, I just expect people who are coming here to be able to understand before they judge. And I think that part of the judgments that I heard um, uh, here last week, and especially some of the judgments that I read in your blog, uh, were just based on a, a, a total misunderstanding that was the result of a level of impatience that I must say, uh, as far as I'm concerned, results from things that have nothing to do with me and my theory, but with other issues and problems that I have nothing to do with. I have still, I have, I still have all the patience that, that is needed in order for us to be able to try to bridge the experiential gap between us by using language for conversation. Uh, but I am not going to allow for interventions in the lecture itself. So I'm going to speak for a whole 90 minutes, and then uh, we're going to have a question and answer period that, as far as I'm concerned, can go on until the morning. We'll have to eat something in the middle. But apart from that. Uh, we can go on talking endlessly about this, but uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of stuff that I have to cover, and uh, and um, we'll do it this way. I will I will talk, then we'll then we'll uh, discuss um, the three issues that came up from you. Um, uh, I would like to say a few a few words about them. Uh, a question came up: What is uh, of, of, of what is experience? What is this notion that I'm talking about? Uh, that is uh, experience, is this, uh, is it uh, cognition, is it sensation, uh, is it intuition, uh, is it perception, what is this uh, thing? Um, I have uh, uh, brought with me um, a, a quote uh, from uh, Michael Oxford, uh, a beautiful book written in 1933 called Experience and Its Modes, uh, simply because uh, Oxford uh, says um, what I would like to say at this point uh, in a way that I could never even hope to be able to say. So instead of saying it myself, I will just read from, from his book um, uh, the following thing. Reflection on the character of experience finds in, in, finds in most men, I'm sorry, this is 1933, so women were still not thought of as uh, reflexive entities. Reflection on the character of experience finds in most men a mind filled with prejudice and confusion. And not uncommonly, these prejudices and this confusion will be found to spring from distinctions elevated into differences, okay? Distinctions elevated into differences. The fact that you can make a distinction does not mean that there is a real difference there. It means that you can make a distinction, distinction for the purposes of talking about it and thinking about it. It doesn't mean that the things themselves are different. One such distinction is that which divides experience into the part which may probably be called thought, that which uh, falls short of the condition of thought, and that which, that we, uh, which passes beyond the condition of thought. Uh, thought, as we have been told, is a particular mode of experience which must be distinguished at once from mere consciousness, from sensation, from perception, from volition, from intuition, and from feeling. And we shall perhaps find ourselves to have inherited also beliefs about the order and relative validity of self modes of experience. Now, it may not be denied that for some purposes, such an analysis of experience may be relevant and useful, and I do not deny that either. These names certainly stand for what can be distinguished. Nevertheless, it is difficult to understand how 
if it is pressed to its conclusion, the issue can be anything but one of error. For in the end, a consciousness which is mere consciousness and not a thinking consciousness turns out to be a mere contradiction. Sensation, when it is isolated, turns out to be a meaningless abstraction. And intuition achieves independence only to discover that uh, to discover that the price of it is non-entity. And the view I propose to maintain is that experience is a single whole within which modifications may be distinguished, but which admits of no final or absolute division. Each of us experiences, and the experience includes feelings and thoughts and hopes and, and perceptions. And uh, everything that you uh, may want, uh, we may, for the purposes of philosophical discussion, make certain distinctions. But I think that uh, unless um, um, people have very, very serious problems, uh, uh, we know, we feel that we experience. We experience at the moment. And we have been experiencing since the moment we were born. And we will go on experiencing until we lose the ability to experience either by death or, or some kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, mental situation of this uh, uh, um, type or, or the other. And what I'm talking about is this whole thing. Um, it is uh, an interesting question. Uh, there is an interesting question of how to think and talk about experience. But I think that there's one thing that cannot be denied. I do not see how we can deny that. The idea, think of it as a pre-intellectual uh, um, idea. Think about it as an intuition, something uh, we all experience, we experience all the time, um, uh, we experience the world, we experience our mental life, we experience our dreams, we experience other people, and, and, and so on and so forth. This is all I need for the purposes of this uh, um, uh, series of lectures, uh, um, for you to just understand that I'm talking about that thing that each of us feels. Okay, that's all um, I, I will need. And there's one point to be stressed, which I would like to stress, with, uh, with the help of, uh, of um, uh, John Dewey, uh, someone who has been thinking a lot and, and, and writing a lot about uh, experience, uh, he says experience is primarily a process of undergoing. Okay, this is this is important for me to, to stress. A process of standing something, of suffering and passion, of affection, in the literal sense of these words. The organism has to endure, to undergo the consequences of its own action. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea here uh, is that experiencing is not just something that happens to us passively, as in perception, like we see things and so on. Experience is something that happens to, happens to us as we engage with the world, as we do, as we try and succeed or fail, as we gradually learn the consequences of what we do. Uh, experience is something that uh, is bigger than any of the notions that, were, that came up in here last time. It is more than perception, it is more than cognition, it is more than feeling, it is all these things together. And what I said last time for me is, is basically the most exact thing that I can think of. All animals with a central nervous system experience, some animals that do not have central nervous systems actually experience. Experiencing is the mode of life that is shared by all, all animals. It is the thing that distinguishes us from non-animals. Um, I think that as far as the, um, uh, this series of lectures um, uh, is concerned, this is all I would, have, uh, I would have to say. And the thing is, once you think about experience as that general holistic mode of life um, that I was talking about here, uh, there is no way uh, to avoid the, the conclusion that is totally obvious to anybody who's not done philosophy, but probably philosophy has made it more difficult to see, um, uh, that uh, the experiences that each and every one of us goes through are different. The very fact that some of us try something and succeed, and some of us try the same thing and fail, the very fact that we go through different biographies, different lives, uh, with different people in different places at different times and so on, means that our experiences are different. This does not mean that our ex experiences are so different that we do not have anything in common. The whole idea of the symbolic landscape says that there are going to be uh, points in our experiences that are going to be mutually identified, which means there are points that are uh, similar enough, okay, not totally similar, but similar enough for us to call by the same name. But uh, uh, the, the general idea is that we have different lives and because of that, 
um, different experiences. Now, the third point, reference. Uh, I was talking about chairs and the you know, pointing events in which someone points at the chair and then the experiences of chairs. And then the question came up, well, where are the chairs themselves? What is going on in the real world? Uh, doesn't language refer to the world? Okay, so um, um, I think that the verb to refer, okay, has been used for a very, very long time in the wrong way. And it is very, very important to understand that and to start uh, using the verb to refer in the right way, okay? It is not language that refers to the world. It is the speaker who uses language in order to refer the listener to the world, okay? So if you think about argument structure, uh, if you think about the different elements that are involved in an event of referring, that it is not an event of referring in which language and the world are participants, okay? You have four participants in the event of referring, a speaker, language as an instrument used by the speaker, a listener, and the word, okay? And today we will see, from my point of view, how this works, but reference is, 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 is an activity involving four elements, and it is an activity that necessarily involves people, okay? The idea it necessarily involves speakers. The idea that a language refers independently uh, to the world, that the machinery, the technology that we invented actually does the work on its own, is something that happens many times when inventions uh, uh, um, uh, get out of order and start, you know, people think that they start managing doing things on their own, okay? And there are two sources for this type of idea that gives independence to language and says that language is language is the entity that does the referring, not the people. There are two sources to this thing that are very, very important. So th this mistake is not like just a mistake, it is an important mistake. There are two sources to it. One source that I can see is that this is a, a, a religious idea. This, this is a religious idea. Um, once, uh, once you think about uh, sacred languages, okay, the way people thought about them, say Hebrew, uh, Sanskrit, um, uh, Greek and so on. When you think about these languages, these languages that have been bestowed on human beings by the powers above, okay, then there is all the justification in the world to think that language refers directly to the world because it was given to us by God, which means that it is truthful, which means that it is a true representation of the world, that it refers directly to the world. If you think about Pani, for example, the, the Indian linguist from 2,500 years ago, uh, his theory of language uh, was based on the idea that language is a godly thing. Language is something that uh, is coming from the world of perfect ideas, uh, not unlike the, the, the Platonic idea. And there, of course, if you think about language as a uh, perfectly true representation of the world, because it is made by the gods and given to human beings, then of course, language refers to the world. There's no problem there. Once we get God out of, out of the picture, and we think about language as something that is was made by people for people, um, then the, the, the act of reference has to be something that we think of as happening to people, by people, and not uh, by language itself. The other source of the idea that language refers uh, to the world is no less um, uh, important. Um, um, there is a whole tradition that thinks of itself. I think that, for example, formal semantics is a very, very good, uh, for a very good example. Say Montague Grammar, for example, for who of you who knows these things, um, a, a, a tradition that sees itself as a descriptive tradition, uh, talking about the way language is. But I think that it is actually better characterized as a prescriptive tradition that uh, uh, tries to see under which conditions language would be able to perfectly describe the world. Okay, so it is not about language as it is, it is about uh, language as it would be, as it would be, had it been what it should be. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, um, I think that um, it's a very, very important tradition, and it is part of the social negotiation of language. So if certain people feel that they would like to, create, to change language into a system that is much more logically strict, a language that, for example, allows for much less ambiguity than it actually does, then logical investigations 
into ambiguity or the lack of um, um, is a part of the attempt to make language less ambiguous. But language as the thing that is out there, the empirical thing that we look at and that we use, is ambiguous, is uh, uh, much less uh, strict than logical uh, theories would like it to be and so on. And um, the, the, I think that the, and part of the utopia, uh, of uh, this prescriptive utopia, says uh, once we manage to create language or push language to a point where it is uh, um, 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 a, a perfectly strict and well-organized system and so on and so forth, that reflects the structure of the world, then we will be able to use language for the discovery of the truth. Uh, that, would be a wonderful, that would be a wonderful result, I think, however, that uh, the experience that we have gained in the last 2,500 years uh, from, from the first major text that, that tried this, um, um, Plato and, and so on, I think that the conclusion should be uh, a little bit less humble a little bit more humble um, uh, than this. Okay. Uh, fourth point: What is going on with the cognitive preconditions or precursors for this whole thing? I'm talking about language as a social entity, but isn't it the fact that below language as a social entity there should be something about our brains, about our cognitions, that allows us to invent, that allows us to learn as children, that allows us to participate in the social game uh, uh, of language and so on. Why? How can I speak about language as a social entity as the primary thing, where uh, it, it seems clear or obvious that the primary thing is the fact that we are all humans with human brains, and because of that we are capable of participating um, in, in this game. Uh, it is. I, I would not dare to object to the idea, I agree with the idea, that our brains uh, are uh, of the type that is capable of participating in the linguistic game, and that there are many, many important, crucial questions about the cognitive preconditions for, every, for everything that I'm talking about. However, I think that the most important thing at this very preliminary um, um, point where we are is to understand that language <coughs> resides at a totally different level of complexity. I think that the basic, the, 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 most, the simplest way to kind of talk about it would be to use the metaphor of the internet. It's, it's, a, it's a new metaphor, it's something that is happening to us right now, I think it is very useful. There are many important preconditions for the activity of the internet that are about the properties of the servers and the client computers that are involved in the system. There are millions and millions of computers. The whole thing is based on the computers. Without the computers, it wouldn't be able to, to be there. And the computers have to have many different properties, uh, uh, most of which I understand nothing about, in order for this whole thing to function. Uh, there's no doubt about that. However, the very fact that the internet is a network that is based on all these millions of computers means that in order for us to understand the internet itself, to understand what is happening on it, the types of dynamics that are happening there, the types of developmental processes that are happening there, how the internet influences us, uh, what we do with it, um, what is happening socially with the internet, all those uh, questions. Uh, we have to look at the internet at the level of complexity where it is, and this level of complexity cannot be reduced to the properties of the servers or the client computers. What is going on is the following thing. First, you look at the internet. If you want to understand the internet, you have to look at the internet as such, at the level of complexity where it is. And then there are going to be certain very important questions of, of two types. One, what are the properties of computers, servers and client computers, that allow for all this to happen? Very important question. Second, what type of dynamic is there where certain necessities on the internet create new softwares for the computers, certain capacities of the computers change the internet, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about, and language is exactly the same kind of thing. It must have our brains. Without our brains, it cannot be there. Uh, uh, and there are many important questions about us as individual cognitive entities that need to be answered. But if you start thinking about language 
as such. You have to put it at the right level of complexity, and the right level of complexity is the social one way beyond the individual brains that are involved, okay? So just to finish this, there are important questions about cognition, and we will get there, okay? We will talk about them in the fifth or the sixth lecture. We'll get there, and I promise to give my own answers about questions of language acquisition uh, and, and the preconditions of language acquisition, the, the preconditions of those hominids that started to invent language, what happened to their brains, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, once I finish giving my answers, of course, you have the right not to agree, but it, you, it will have to wait there to that point because there's a lot of stuff that we have to talk about at the level of complexity where we are, which is the level of complexity of language as a social entity. Okay, uh, I, I, we talked about the symbolic landscape uh, last time and about the triple nature of the sign. Every sign is a signifier, signifying in a cluster of, uh, of experience. And I just want to say um, one more thing or two things to, to, to end this part and move on to, the, to, to what is actually, properly speaking, the topic of this uh, lecture. Uh, th there is a process, we said, of digitization where um, the mutual identification of points in, in, in our experiences creates digital points on the symbolic, uh, on the symbolic landscape. And it is important to, um, to understand that uh, the fact that the symbolic landscape gradually um, becomes a very, very complex net of semantic relationships between different signs is a necessary consequence of the process of demarcation that gives rise to the symbolic landscape in the first place. So remember, we started by saying, we first pointed this and this, and then we pointed that, and we say this is different enough from that thing in order for us to give it a different name, right? So we start giving names to things. Uh, in order for us to be able to do that, we have to make certain distinctions. So um, for example, assume that we want to give names to different types of animals, all right? Uh, giraffes and bears and, and lions. In order for us to be able to do that, we have to abstract away, we have to ignore, for example, the fact that they are, there are female and male um, uh, types of these animals, okay? Um, in order to, for us to give names to animals, we have to abstract away from, uh, from sex, okay? In order for us to give names to female and male uh, types of animals, we have to abstract away from the type of animal, okay? It is not usually the case, or actually I don't know of one language where it is, where uh, you, you systematically have different names for female and male uh, types of animals. There are certain animals in which this is the case, okay, so in Hebrew, for example, female lion and male lion are just simply two different words, and there are instances of that uh, in different languages, but it, this is not, this is not the, the, the systematic case, okay? You have to abstract away from certain elements in your experience in order to name something, and then you will have to abstract away from this in order to name uh, something else, which means that once you put these digital points on the symbolic landscape, those connections are going to sort of come back, okay? So um, um, uh, you're going to have, for each demarcation between types of animals, you're going to have uh, um, uh, a certain level on the symbolic landscape in which you will have to uh, connect this to the distinction between male and female. So the, 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 the whole thing there, the whole um, uh, net of semantic relationships is connected in different ways because of this process of demarcation. And this is something that happens, I think, most dramatically with verbs, much more than with nouns. Because think, for example, about uh, there's this wonderful line from Yeats uh, in, in, a, in a poem called Amongst School Children. He asks, how can we know the dancer from the dance? And this is a very, this is a very important question, okay? And you can never point at a dancing event without at the very same time pointing directly at the dancer, okay? So being able to distinguish the dancing from the dancer in order for us to have a verb means that you have to abstract away from the personality, the, the, the actual entity of the dancer, okay? But then, for you to be able to point at the person dancing and call him or her a dancer, okay? Uh, once you manage to do that, then the words dancer and dance must be related to each other semantically because otherwise 
the, the relationship between the experiences would be missed out. Okay, we said that when experiences are related to each other, the semantic landscape creates a semantic, uh, a semantic uh, relationship. So what is happening on the symbolic landscape is something that in the linguistic literature has been called uh, thematic roles. Okay, so verbs, um, signs that are verbal, come with their uh, stereotypical participants. Okay, so an event of breaking uh, is related on the symbolic landscape with a thing broken and the thing breaking it, okay, uh, an agent and a patient. Um, uh, the verb to dance comes with a prototypic, with a stereotypical uh, um, uh, dancer uh, and so on. And eventually, when you think about the emergence of the semantic relationships of the symbolic landscape, you get certain generalizations there. Elements of order that are emerging, okay, without actually having propositions written in the mind about that, but these are like uh, orderly patterns that come back again and again. So, for example, eventualities have stereotypical participants, okay? Each type of eventuality with stereotypical participants that they have. Uh, eventualities are related to other eventualities as causes or reasons or goals. Eventualities are related to time frames. They happen uh, in, in the past or the future or in the present. And remember, uh, all of these things, okay, are semantic distinctions and relationships on the symbolic landscape, and they may or may not be systematically related to the way we experience the world, okay? So for example, if you think about gender distinctions in languages, okay? For example, the distinction in Hebrew between male and female applies to all um, uh, nouns, okay? Inanimate as well as, animate as well as inanimate, okay? We usually uh, experience people as gender, it would probably be a very sad world if we didn't, but we do not, uh, we do not uh, um, experience uh, chairs and tables uh, as female or, or male, but as far as the symbolic landscape of Hebrew is concerned, okay, all things have gender, uh, and, and this is a result of a historical process in which at this point or the other, uh, people decided uh, that for the purposes of communication, for the purposes of uh, the common ground, everything will have gender, and there is a wonderful question to be asked of why this is why this was the case, why this is what happened. Is this a case of overgeneralization that wasn't even justified then? Was there a worldview that was shared by people at that time that said that inanimate things actually do have gender and so on and so forth? All kinds of very important social questions that we're not going to uh, get into, um, um, but um, the, 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 there's, there's an extremely complex um, uh, set of semantic relationships between the different elements on the symbolic landscape, and they may or may not be systematically related to the way different people in the communities experience the world. Okay? Um, th this is basically where, where we should have uh, uh, gotten uh, last time. Now I will uh, start um, the, the, the second lecture, and, and this is about communication. We have said there is this symbolic landscape, we have talked about the conventional and meaning, but we haven't said a word until now about why this whole thing is there and what people do with it, what's the idea. The idea is the following. We said each of us has an experiential world, and we have between us a symbolic landscape that is common, that, that, that creates common ground between us with words that are digi digitally uh, uh, demarcated. Linguistic communication within the theory that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm developing uh, is a process in which experiential intents, okay, the intent to communicate at the experiential level, are channeled from speaker to listener through the common worldview of language. So the idea is the following. Okay, uh, um, the will to communicate is experiential. It is not based in the language. It is not a result of the fact that we have language. This is something that is coming for each of us from within an experiential uh, feeling or whichever way you want to call it, the words really, the, the, the exact words really here are not important. This is just the same situation as with the notion of experience. 
uh, children before they learn language uh, at the age of, of, of one, for example, or even later when they only have partial knowledge of certain elements of the language, already have experiential intent. They, you, you know, if, if you have children, you know that there are many situations in which children want to communicate something, but they do not yet have the, 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 the technology that they need in order to communicate that. Um, uh, our ancestor, ancestors um, uh, definitely had experiential intent, things that they wanted to communicate before they invented uh, language. And when you look, for example, at Kanzi, uh, the, the chimpanzee that um, was raised in America and, and learned something like you know, 250 words uh, and so on, uh, an important phenomenon that we'll talk about in the fifth lecture, uh, you see that Kanzi, and not just him, but his whole uh, family, uh, you look at the movies, you see there are situations in which they want to express something, but they do not know how. Uh, and more, most importantly, the will to communicate with each and every one of us at every single moment that we want to talk, the, the will to communicate emerges and happens to us before we start speaking. Okay? So it's not the case that we just produce uh, accidental sentences because the, the, the technology allows us to produce them. Sometimes there are situations in which we just use the technology for fun and we make funny sentences and so on. But usually what is happening is we have a will to communicate, a certain intent, and then uh, we uh, uh, have to try our best to use the technology in order to communicate that thing to another person. One point in parenthesis that will become important later, but I have to say it uh, right now. There are many types of experiential intents that are directly experientially communicated without the usage of this complex technology of language. Okay? So uh, certain emotive intents uh, can be expressed directly by a hug or, or by a fist or by a smile or any of these things. And there are ways in which certain types of experiential intents um, um, are expressible without language. But basically the idea is I'm going through some kind of experience, assuming that we're talking about a communicative uh, event in which I tell you something, an assertive event, uh, a certain experience happens to me, I want to tell you about it, okay? Uh, um, and what is happening is the following thing. I have my experiential intent and its content, the thing that I want to express to you as part of my experience, I have to find a way to turn, translate, my experiential intent into a representation that uh, is built from the building blocks of language, from the symbolic landscape and other things like grammatical rules and so on that we haven't gotten to, we'll talk about them next week, uh, uh, create something that is made out of the building blocks of language, then you as the, as the listener have to be able to hear this, interpret it, and eventually produce an experiential interpretation um, uh, that if the communicative event is successful will be similar enough for to the experiential to my experiential intent uh, uh, so that you will know more or less uh, what I was trying um, um, to talk about okay there's a, a lot to say about experiential intents and this will happen later what I just want to, to, to say now, uh, because I know that sometimes people feel uh, that um, experiential intents are already based on the structures of language. Okay, we already want to communicate uh, on the basis of what language allows us to do. So again, there's a technology, and a lot of people feel that we already have create, have turned ourselves into end creatures who only want to communicate what the technology allows them to communicate. The, 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 there's nothing, I think, more fundamentally wrong than this idea. Uh, what we want to communicate comes, evolves within us, not on the basis of the technology, but before the technology. And the technology is there for us to, to try to express it. And the, 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 the result of this, uh, which I think is something that is a major part of the experience of each and every one of us, the result of this is that many, many, many times when you try to express something using the technology of language and it will just turn out, we will understand that this is not what we meant. Okay? Um, I think that there's one experience 
uh, that I, I hope that we all share, which is extremely important here, where you read someone, you, you read something by someone who's like a, an enormous writer. You know, like you read, you read a, 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 a column in the paper by someone who's like a great columnist about politics, for example, okay? And you get this feeling of, well, this is exactly what I was thinking, but I never knew how to put it in words, okay? Or you read a wonderful novel, and you say, this touches me, I know exactly what this guy is talking about, I could have never written this, okay? The, what is happening in, this, uh, in, 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 in these experiences and others that are similar, okay, is a situation where you say, I have probably had an experiential intent very similar, or similar enough, to that of the writer, and we both had the technology in front of us, but it turns out that that person knew how to use the technology much better than we did, and we couldn't make it, and that person could, okay? A situation where you try to write a paper, and there's an idea that is lurking in your mind, and you're trying this formulation and the other formulation, and you erase and you write again, and you erase and you write again, and it just doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, after three days, you find a certain formulation and you say, okay, this is fine, okay? It, this is not a situation where you didn't know what you wanted to say from the very beginning, and only by the usage of language you managed to get there. Sometimes there are situations in which the usage of the technology helped you clarify your thoughts for you, but in most cases, the situation is one in which, like what, exactly like in, in painting, uh, you have a certain experience that you want to convey, and, and you have a very hard time using the technology because the technology is very, very complex. It's just like uh, painting a picture of, of someone that, that, that you, you know, like, of a loved one. Okay? You know exactly what the face looks like because you have looked at the face a hundred times. Okay? You would recognize it in, in full darkness. But then you take the pencil and the page and you try to, you, to draw the picture and it just doesn't work in the first, second time. And for most of us it never works. And there are some people who are capable of uh, looking at the face and doing the drawing and you say, ah, this is the person. Uh, the person who is uh, doing the drawing well is someone who knows how to use the technology to convey something that experientially is probably not very different from what we have in our minds. We have control of the technology in a much less, much less efficient way. The very same thing with the, with the technology of language. We'll get back to, to certain aspects of this later. But at the moment, what I want to do is just portray, and this is like a first step in, in this, a first step, a first sub-step, in the second step of the, of the series, to portray the process of linguistic communication uh, in a little bit more detailed way, uh, a process of iterative translation, okay? So I have an experiential intent, and I want to get to a point where you have an experiential interpretation. And by the way, experiential doesn't mean that it's always about emotions and all this stuff, okay? I think that I've made that clear. If I'm talking about chairs, then the sign that I have for chairs has chairs in them. And it would be useful if, when I use the word chair, you eventually uh, connect this to your experiences of chairs. Because otherwise, if, for example, you think that chairs are uh, video cameras and, 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 uh, and you, you connect my words to video cameras, then something hasn't worked right. Uh, so here's, here's, a, here's a picture, a drawing of the process uh, the way the way I, I see it. We begin with uh, we begin with the speaker's experiential intent, okay, which is uh, private uh, because it's within our experiences. It doesn't mean that it. Using the word private here does not mean that it is not shared by anybody else. It does not mean that it is secluded from the world. It means that it is evolving inside a person's head. Okay? The first, pro the first step of translation is one in which uh, it is a very complex step, and next week we'll see that it is broken into many, many different steps, which are very important. But generally speaking, the first step would be the one uh, in which the experiential intent is translated into the uh, speaker's 
semantic message. What does that mean? It means that I have an experiential intent in my mind, and as a first step, still inside my mind, I have to translate the experiential intent into a certain combination of the building blocks that I have in my symbolic landscape, and to create a message, a certain combination of the semantic elements in the symbolic landscape, that would be uh, the best first approximation that I can find to my experiential intent. And here, of course, one, some of us would be able to do a very much better job than others. Great writers uh, um, uh, would be able to do, for example, a greater job than, than uh, many of the rest of us. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the speaker's semantic message is then that has to be translated uh, into the speaker's utterance, okay, which is um, um, an entity parallel to the message. The message is semantic. The utterance is the combination of the signifiers that are uh, related. Okay, so I have I have a, an experiential intent that includes my experience of this chair. Okay, I want to tell you that this chair is comfortable. Uh, the experience is about this thing, okay, my experience of this thing. Then uh, I, I have to use the signified chair inside my message, and then I have to use the signifier chair uh, to, to, uh, um, to create an utterance. Uh, okay, uh, the utterance has to be um, um, turned into a phonetic um, representation, which eventually has to be turned into uh, a, a series of sound waves. Okay. Uh, eventually, after I uh, produce my utterance and my mind decides how to phonetically uh, pronounce it, I eventually have to actually pronounce it with my with my uh, uh, with my mouth. And, uh, and, and send it out, okay? The sound waves uh, have to uh, be heard by the listeners, uh, by the listener, um, and eventually turn into the listener's utterance. And again, each of these steps is a sea of complexities, and, and uh, I know you don't see because it's too, no, okay. Uh, it's too down below, you can see it, it's okay. Uh, uh, it has to be um, translated into the, uh, the listener's uh, utterance. The, the listener has to uh, be able to uh, hear uh, a sentence made out of signifiers, then turn it into a message, the listener's message, that is, uh, have a representation of the semantic meaning of the sentence um, uh, based on the utterance, and then it has to be translated into the listener's interpretation, which is again experiential and private, this time in the mind of, of the listener. Okay? So, uh, uh, as opposed to a situation where I experience happiness to see you and I experientially come to hug and you experientially experience my hugging and this is the way communication works, language does something that is much, much more complicated and again, in the fifth or sixth lectures we'll get to the question of why does language have to be so complicated? There are very, very good reasons because the whole function of this thing uh, um, uh, is one in which experiential communication stops working. Um, there are things that you cannot hug and smile about, and that's where language uh, uh, comes in. Uh, but it's, it's a process of iterative translation, experiential intent, semantic message, utterance, structural utterance. Maybe, maybe I should do this, call it this structural, so it will be we know where we are. Uh, the structural utterance turned into a sound wave, the sound wave becoming a structural utterance in the mind of the listener. The listener translates the utterance into a message and the message into an interpretation. Uh, there's, there are a few lines that I would like to draw here. 
um, which are, which are uh, of importance. First, all this and all this is happening inside people's minds. Okay? So all the cognitive questions, all the cognitive questions about the process of communication are questions about what is happening in the process where we translate our intents into messages and into utterances, or when we translate utterances into messages, into experiential interpretations, how we do that, what we do there, how we learn how to do it, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, uh, uh, apart from the moment in which this whole thing translates into a sound wave, uh, this thing happens inside minds, so if you th if you want to think if you want to think about language like to think about the internet, uh, there are major pieces of software and major skills that individual people have to have in order to be able to participate in the social game of language. Okay, so language is a social thing, but for us to be able to participate in in it, we have to have the knowledge of how to do that. We have to have major elements of the social thing. Uh, um, brought into our minds. Okay, when we think about this area, okay, then you see that all this, all the area that is green, is social. Okay, so my experiential intent is private, but the message that I produce is already in terms of the symbolic landscape, so it is already social. It is cognitive and social, and the utterance, of course, is based on the rules of the language and the, the way the signifiers are, and so on. Uh, sound waves uh, move between different people in the social environment, and uh, and um, uh, the same thing happens here. Okay, so um, uh, and sorry, uh, this whole this place, this area here in the middle is, you know, you may call it physical or something. This is where, this is where something happens outside of people's bodies. It happens between them. So, if you think about this uh, uh, drawing, what you see is the following thing. Something that is cognitive and private and experiential is first translated into something that is still cognitive, but social and semantic. It is then translated, it, translated into something that is cognitive and social and structural, which is then translated into something that is physical, then again translated into something that is cognitive, social, and structural, then something that is cognitive, social, and semantic, and then something that is cognitive, private, and experiential. Okay, so you're talking about an iterative process of translation in which social and cognitive are intermingled in, in ways that really cannot be distinguished. The whole, the whole uh, idea that was probably the most important idea of 20th century linguistics, that you can think in either social or cognitive terms about language, is something that I think, from this point of view, is, is a total absurdity. Okay? Uh, the social and the cognitive are totally connected. The whole system is based on the idea that the social is um, um, what's the word? The, 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 the social is internalized uh, in people's minds. Uh, pieces of social, socially developed software are put in our minds in order for us to be able to communicate with each other. Okay, uh, much of what we're going to talk about uh, in the next two lectures is going to be about different aspects of this uh, of this uh, uh, general model and, um, and and what linguistic communication is uh, within this uh, within this general uh, framework. There are many many implications to this. Uh, for example, for a theory of translation, for theories of language and power, for cognitive theories. Um, um, a, a lot of implications for different things, but before we get there, we'll have to get a little deeper into the uh, actual properties 
of this process uh, uh, in, in different ways. One thing that I will say now as a preview for what's going to happen, say, uh, next week, but it's kind of important for me um, to say it right now, is that uh, there is another element that is involved in this whole thing, uh, which I haven't explicitly talked about until now. I have only talked about the conventionalization of meaning, okay? So the, the, the basic building blocks that are used in order to create the semantic message, but there is an entirely different, another level of conventionalization, which is the conventionalization of communication, how we should speak, and, and, and what is involved there is, for example, what are the ways in which we are allowed and disallowed to translate our experiential intents into semantic messages? What are the ways that we are allowed and disallowed to turn a message into an utterance? Okay? So issues of grammar and, and, and so on, but also issues of discourse. One thing that for social scientists is totally obvious, for example, uh, is the fact that certain experiential intents you're simply not allowed to create a semantic patterns, a semantic message of. Okay, taboo words, for example. Okay, uh, uh, um, issues of sex in, in many many cultures, actually in most cultures, uh, there are many types of experiences. Okay, um, that the language tells you. The language as a social entity tells you, with all due respect. Okay, you are not going to create a semantic message that is a first approximation to your experience. You're going to keep it privately to yourself, or the language says there are going to be um, uh, different uh, conventions for communication at different levels of the society. Okay, just as there are going to be different elements in the symbolic landscape. So, if you want to talk to uh, a good friend um, um, about sex and you've had a couple of beers and it's very early, in the, uh, very late in the evening, uh, language tells you, language is a social entity that tells you what you can do, tells you at this hour of the night with a good intimate friend after a few beers, there are certain <laughs> elements of the symbolic landscape that you're going to be able to use in order to express your experience. That's fine. If you want to talk to your grandmother, okay, it doesn't matter which time of the day, it doesn't matter how many years, you're not allowed to, you're not going to be allowed uh, to do that. So there's a lot of stuff that conventionalizes this process that go beyond the actual meanings, and we haven't talked about them yet at all, so I just want to say they are there, okay, they are there, we're going to talk about them next week, they're very important, but at the moment, there's something slightly different that I want to do with this picture, and that is the following. That is the following thing. I want to talk. You have to thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the, the the function of this whole system, not in terms of why we have the, the system. Um, but what does it mean to communicate? What, what would a successful communicative event be in this kind of, in this kind of picture? Okay? Um, how are we going to be able to talk about success and failure in the usage of this technology? Just like with any other technology, we are going to uh, sometimes fail and sometimes succeed. And the question is, uh, um, what, what, what's going on um, with, this, with this question of, of, uh, of success? Okay. At, the, at the most basic level, there are going to be very complicated levels of success involved with this system. For example, what would communicative, communicative success be when you talk about the usage of this technology in poetry? A very, very complex question, okay? Uh, um, um, what, what, what did it mean uh, um, to say, who, who's the one working on Shakespeare here? Oh, if you had uh, Okay, okay, but, but, but what, what, what would it mean to say that the usage of the system for poetic or artistic purposes um, um, is something that you know was successful or not? I'm not going to talk about this. This is a very very complicated question. Um, um, in order to understand it, I think that we need to start at the basic level and talk about straight communication. Talk about uh, the usage of language, not in order to write songs, uh, poems, and, and novels, 
but in order to communicate, to talk uh, to each other. What would be success? What would the notion of success mean uh, uh, when you think about linguistic communication uh, this way? For me, the, 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 the notion of success in this system is, is the following. A, a, a communicative event is successful to the extent Okay, so we're not talking about either or, but to the extent that the listener managed to create an experiential interpretation for, for herself or himself, okay? To the extent that the experiential interpretation is similar to the experiential intent. Okay, so, for example, assume that, uh, that uh, I want to tell you that uh, the chair is comfortable. All right, and you don't see the chair. Uh, it's it's hidden here. Okay, and I'm telling you this chair uh, is comfortable. All right, uh, to the extent that um, um, we have similar um, um, experiential representations of chairs and all the other issues, like for example, comfortable and so on. And to the extent that my experiential intent was really you know, um, well translated into the semantic message and the whole thing worked right. And in the end, uh, you got an, in, in, interpreta uh, an experiential interpretation in which you have an experiential representation of something that is similar to what I had in mind, like this chair, and you have a similar experience of comfort and, and so on. All the rules worked right and so on. And you get an inter uh, expression or interpretation uh, that is similar to mine, then to the extent that it is similar, the communicative event um, was successful. Okay? If you do not have representations, uh, uh, expression or representations of chairs at all, you have never seen chairs, or you have never felt comfortable in your life, okay? uh, uh, or whatever else you, know, you, you, you may think of, um, and you, you may uh, go through the whole uh, process, okay? Uh, but but your experiential intent is not going to be similar enough to mine, and we'll say the the, the event uh, failed, and, and you can see a lot of gradations here, okay? So for example, it may be the case that you do have the word chair in your lexicon, and you do have representations of chairs, but they are all like I don't know bar stools or something like that. So you will. And assume that I'm talking about the bar stool when I say chair, and you will get something that is an approximation to what I intended, but it's going to be more different than what I intended than if you had a representation of a chair and so on. There are uh, 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 a few different levels uh, of, of uh, um, a few different issues involved in this picture, uh, which together create. Uh, for each communicative event, um, a, a result that is more or less uh, successful. Okay, so one thing, uh, the physics have to work right, okay? Uh, so the communicative event will be successful to the extent that the physic physics work right. If, for example, there is too much noise between us and you don't hear my words, the communicative event is going to fail. So uh, this is here, okay? The physics have to work right, and the physics have to work right in all kinds of other ways. So for example, uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas came to, to Tel Aviv University um, two years ago after he had the stroke, uh, and he gave a, a lecture, and he spoke with one half of his uh, face paralyzed, and the, the, the room was full of people who, believe me, wanted to hear every word. Um, and it was impossible to understand uh, what he was trying to say uh, because the physics, unfortunately, didn't work right. So there's a lot of stuff that is involved uh, in that. Okay, so the physics is, is, uh, is one element um, of the story. Okay, the speaker and the listener have to share the same language. Okay, they have to have I'm sorry, I, I don't want to say this like uh, in an all or nothing situation. The communicative event is successful to the extent that the speaker and listener have the same language, that is, the same building blocks at the sem uh, semantic level, uh, the same semantic relationships between them, the same grammatical rules, the same rules of, uh, of discourse, and so on and so forth. 
Okay, so the the, the whole process is, is based founded on, dependent on the idea that once you um, uh, have the, the physical sound waves, the whole process that the, 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 the listener goes through in translating it into an address and adding to a message is based on the same rules okay, as the ones of the speaker. We said in the first lecture, everything is about mutual identification. We have to mutually identify words, we have to mutually identify grammatical rules. We'll talk about that uh, uh, next week. And, and the whole system uh, is based on this mutual identification thing. If we do not have the same language, um, uh, then to the extent that we don't have the language, the same language, the, the, the process of communication will fail. So start with a situation where, uh, start with a situation that is the most extreme, okay? Where someone on the street here, uh, totally naively and in good faith, produces a sentence in Hungarian, I'm the listener, okay? So failure of communication. I just don't have any of the rules, any of the words, any of, of the, the things that I need uh, for that. But then, you know, develop this um, into more and more complicated and interesting situations where, for example, um, the speaker and the listener have most of the elements in their language mutually identified, but some elements that are not. So certain words, for example, that the speaker uses but the listener doesn't know, or, or, and so on and so forth. Different words that both speaker and listener know, but have slightly different meanings for, okay? Uh, minute differences in the semantic connections between words will create a situation where eventually some of the interpretation will be different. So a small failure um, in the uh, process. And sorry, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, um, okay, so so this is about this is about um, uh, the language. The language has to be the same. One word in parentheses here before we move on, which is very important. The question of language acquisition is a question about how we as individuals manage to join in to the uh, uh, social um, uh, activity of language, okay? How we get to the point where we can actually do this, okay? Because language is all about mutual identification, because language is all about me and you having the same language so that we can understand each other, the question of language acquisition is not what it was thought to be, um, say, for example, since Chomsky. It is not just the question of how I manage as a child to acquire the language. It is a much more complicated question. It is a question of how do children who live in the same place actually manage to have the same language, to acquire the same language. The whole point of acquiring the language is the point of acquiring the same language as the others, okay? So the question is, uh, is actually a, a classical question of, of, of social learning. It is not just how do I learn language, it is how do I learn the same language that the other kids around me learn. And when we get to talk about language acquisition, we'll see that one of the most important elements that actually happen in the process of language acquisition is that the children uh, do not just learn from the adults. At a very, very early age, okay, from say the age of three in kindergarten, there is a process in which the most important element that influences the language of the children is the way the other children in the kindergarten speak. I think everybody who's a parent knows about that. So for example, if you are, if you live in a different country uh, and you're a non-native speaker of the language, uh, there's a point in which your, your uh, son or daughter uh, simply starts speaking the original language and refuses, most times refuses, sometimes, uh, um, you know, half of refuses uh, to speak the original language. And the process is one in which uh, all the children in a certain environment spiral together, okay? They learn from each other and the, one of the goals that they have is to speak like, you know, it, it, it's always, it, speak like John, you know, and speak like someone. Uh, they imitate each other, they mimic each other, and the, the whole point is that if you do not get to a point, you may be the best language acquirer in the whole world. If you do not acquire the system of language that is similar to the system that the others are acquiring, then you're going to be in a, have a problem 
in, in, um, in uh, using the system because the, 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 the language has to be mutually identified. It has to be the same uh, thing. The third thing, so we, said that we talked about the physics and we talked about the, the language. The third thing that has to work in order for this thing to, to, to be, uh, to be uh, successful is uh, that, is that uh, the experiences of um, uh, the speaker and the listener, okay? Again, I'm, I'm, the language fails me every time. The communication is successful to the extent that the experiences of the listener and the speaker are compatible, are more similar, okay? Um, um, that, that communication will be successful. So think about a situation, for example, where you have, for example, native speakers of language, uh, native speakers of, say, English, okay? In different places in the world, okay? And forget for a moment, just forget, this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, for, forget for a moment about the fact that the different Englishes are different. British English, American English, Australian English, Indian English, they have differences between them. Assume just for a moment that this is not the problem we're talking about. Assume that uh, the languages are compatible, they are mutually identified with the whole thing. However, the experiences uh, where the different people, uh, you know, where they live, the time they live, the, the, the place, the customs, the ideas, the, the people, whatever, uh, the music, whatever, everything that is in, in, in the experience, the experiences are more different, okay, uh, than uh, in certain ways, than the experiences of, say, people who speak the same language but also, say, live in the same place, okay? So the very same communicative event would be more or less successful on the basis of the uh, compatibility between the experiences. So the, the, uh, this is something that comes up again and again and again in translation theory. It's a major issue in translation, and it starts with the most trivial uh, things, uh, you know, names of places and so on uh, that you know might be unknown to, to people with different experiences, but it also goes down to very deep things. So the more the 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 more the, the experiences are compatible with each other, the more successful the communicative event will be. And again, note uh, it's not a note; it's it's you know it's a, a very very important crucial thing. Because experiences are always different, doesn't matter whether you were born in the same neighborhood because you were different people with different biographies and so on. The the uh, um, uh, there is always going to be an element of miscommunication uh, in every act of communication. Okay, and, and, and in a while we'll see this more explicitly. Uh, there's always going to be an element of miscommunication because the experience experiences are always going to be different. But then there's the question of how different the experiences are going to be, and they may be more or less different, and the more different they are, uh, the more difficult it will be to have a successful event of communication. And the fourth element that is very important there, okay, is the one, in, is the following. To what extent the experiences of the listener and the speaker are compatible with the semantic model of the symbolic landscape of the language? All right, so um, um, there, 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 there may be, uh, there are many, many situations. Okay, I gave you just a small example before when we talked about gender uh, and the fact that language forces you to talk about inanimate entities as if they are gendered. Uh, there are going to be situations in which the speaker is going, to, this, the physics are going to work right, the speakers have the same language, the experiences are similar enough, but language is going to force the speaker to translate the experiential intent into a message that already is not very good, not, 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 uh, not you know, good enough, uh, because the language is going to be less compatible with the experience. So every, the, the, the entire process is going to be influenced by that, and the chances of the listener actually understanding what the speaker wants to say at the experience level are, are, uh, are reduced, okay? Uh, there's a, 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 lot of, a lot of literature uh, in the social sciences coming from the Otal and, and, and other people uh, about uh, what he calls the, the difference, uh, the, the, the situation where uh, the language, because of political reasons and so on and so forth, is structured semantically in a way 
that from the very beginning is unsuitable for the expression of certain experiences because these experiences, for example, have not been the experiences of the people who had the power to construct the language. Okay? So a situation where the language is, is basically unsuitable uh, sorry, to the extent that the language is unsuitable for the expression of your experiences, then the chances of the communicative event to be successful are, are reduced. Okay? So, at the best of worlds, when there's no noise, all the physics work right, the, the, exper the, exper the experiential world of the speaker and the listener are very, very close to each other, okay? Uh, two people, um, um, probably, probably, I don't know, this is a question that is of interest. When, like, do they have to be of the same gender? I don't know, it's, it's an in interesting question. Do they have to be from the same neighborhood? Do they have to be, I don't know what, they, very important questions about what would be the conditions for uh, the, 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 the greatest amount of similarity possible between experiences. But a situation where people have a lot of affinity at, their, in, at the level of experiences, and they speak a language that is perf almost perfectly mutually identified to the extent that it's possible. And everything is very, very quiet. And there's no problem. And their mouths work right. And everything is perfect. This is a situation where this system works as well as it, is, as, as well as it can. But now start putting more and more differences in the experiential level, more and more differences at the level of the language, more and more noise, and you see what happens in communication in regular day-to-day -day life. Uh, um, uh, in, in, in most contexts, in most situations, uh, we communicate and miscommunicate at the same time. We, we, a lot of the conversations, if you follow, if you follow, if you, if you take a conversation between just two people and you follow the conversation sentence by sentence, you can see that huge percentages of the conversation would be would go around the situation where the speaker would say something, the listener would get it wrong, the listener would react to the wrong idea, the speaker would say, no, that's not what I meant, the listener would say, no, no, that's not what I meant, that you meant, yes, I know, but I meant something else, and so on. And a lot of, a lot of the, 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 uh, what is happening is conversation, in conversation runs around these difficulties because language is a very, very fragile system. Okay, uh, very, very, very far from the omnipotent view of language that you know comes from different sectors. It's a very, very fragile, very complicated, very complex uh, system that has um, uh, the, 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 the possibility, the potential for failure, uh, waiting um, behind every corner. It's it's very, very, very important to understand that. Um, uh, because there's an enormous amount of empirical issues that, that, that once you want to address them in what is happening to language, both in the mind and in society, if you want to address them and you think about language as a very, very strong and efficient language, you're not, and a system you're not going to understand what is happening. And, and a major part of the understanding of language that is required, I think, is the understanding that it's a very, very fragile technology that is prone to failure um, uh, uh, in many, many cases. Okay. Um, all right, let's go back to the four people that we were talking about in the first lecture, A, B, uh, C, and D, and play with them a little bit more. Okay? Assume that they uh, go on developing their language, adding more and more words and rules and, 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 and whatever. Um, what is going to happen is that they are going to use those uh, um, um, inventions of theirs for communication and they are going to start experiencing instances of failure and success. Okay? So, um, so um, uh, if, if A thinks about chairs uh, the word chair refers to uh, you know, this type of chair, and D this simply thinks about it as something to, to sit on, okay, experientially. Uh, and, and I told you before, you know, D is going to see a stool and call it a chair. C is going, A is going to experience a, an instance of failure communication. This is not a chair. Why did I have to come all the way here to grab this thing? It's a stool. I don't want a stool. You promised a chair. I found something else, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be 
a process in which the different individuals are going to differentially experience the fact that they are identifying with different people. Okay? We, we say, I read this novel and I identified with a hero. What, do you mean I, what does it mean I identified? It means I identified the same things. There was mutual identification, not with the hero of the book, but there was, I, I felt an identification, meaning my feeling was my experiential world is more similar to that person than, than to others. And there's going to be certain processes of social stratification based on this notion of identification. Not the only processes of stratification, there are going to be many other things involved, okay? Uh, money uh, and, and, and a lot of stuff. But at the level of discourse, assume for example that A, B and C are going to uh, gradually feel that something is working out well for them. They're inventing more and more words. Uh, They're pointing at things, the other person knows exactly what you meant. There's less, not exactly, less mistakes. Uh, uh, the process of, of invention is going to become uh, more rapid. Uh, there's going to be a sense of, okay, uh, this guy is more like me. I can, I, can, I can get into a conversation with this guy and so on. Assume that they are feeling better with each other and with this new invention. And, and D is gradually feeling that, that he or she are being left out. Okay, uh, because of all kinds of reasons, for example, I don't know if this ever happened to you, uh, but you know, a bunch of people are sitting and talking, and you're trying to get in a sentence, and you're saying the sentence, and no one reacts, and they go on talking about something else. Has it ever happened to you? I don't know. Uh, uh, you're trying, you're trying to, to um, uh, get the attention of people, by pointing to something, get the attention, trying to get a point where you are running a, po a, a naming event, okay? You want to name something, and you're pointing at something, and you're giving it a word that the other are just, you know, they don't understand what's going on. For example, A, B, and C uh, don't care about flowers, okay? D cares about flowers a lot. D would like to give different names to different flowers. Uh, a, B, and C just don't care, okay? And so on and so forth. I think that if you really make an effort, you can uh, identify with this type of experience. Okay, what are the options of D in this kind of situation? Okay, what is D going to be able to do uh, in a situation where D feels gradually left out from the discursive process of the invention of language, okay? There are going to be five, five different strategies all of which are extremely important for the understanding of language, okay? Uh, it's not just a tale that I'm, I'm telling here. This is very, for me, this is very, very important stuff. Okay. Um, first, D could leave, okay? D could simply decide, uh, I've seen E and F walking on the beach. I'll try hooking up with them. Okay? Uh, and he would go and, and, and talk to ENF, and it would turn out that they're identifying the world in better together. Okay? Uh, the process of the invention is one engine, and again, there are many others, okay? One engine in the, uh, uh, in the situation that you see all over the place, where uh, groups are separating into subgroups, people are connecting to, to different people, and again, and again, uh, uh, an experience that I don't know if you've ever shared of being in, for example, in a classroom, you know, being in a class in, in, in high school with a lot of people that you feel, you just feel, you can't communicate with, and then, for example, going to a different school, uh, to a different class, and all of a sudden feeling these are people I can talk to. Okay, so this is a situation where these are people I can talk to means, okay, that the process here works better for me with them than it did with, with the other people because our experiences are more similar because we speak the same language and so on and so forth, okay? So D could leave. That is one, one uh, important um, uh, element of the, of the story um, and, and it has many, many consequences that we're not going to touch on at the moment. Okay. D could stay and experientially live with this group but be more and more left out from the discursive process of inventing the language and developing it 
and more and more left out in terms of the ability to use language in order to communicate and in order to get to a point where there is mutual identification of the experiences with the other people. Okay? So staying with these people at the experiential level and remaining relatively mute in terms of the usage of language. Okay? If you think in terms of, say, gender studies about what has happened to women in traditional societies in terms of the usage of language, I think this is a pretty good way of theoretically characterizing um, what is happening where, uh, in, in, in hierarchical situations where men and women uh, live together, but the men are mostly the people who are the, the, the inventors and developers and users of language, uh, the, 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 semantic, the, the symbolic landscape of the society uh, is, is founded by men, for men, for, for men experiences, for men communication and so on. And women uh, are there at the experiential level, but the language is much less suitable for their experiential needs uh, and so on and so forth. A situation where the men mutually identify each other through language, but the women remain mysterious and so on. Where where, uh, where uh, special languages are developed by women for themselves uh, and so on. A lot of the social dynamics uh, that are involved in the relation between gender relationships and language, I think can be characterized in terms of uh, this kind of situation where, um, uh, you know, um, the people who have the, the power to construct language uh, leave certain type of other people outside the, the realm, and then uh, there are all the different consequences. Okay, that, that is the second. That is the second uh, uh, option. Okay, the third option, and then the fifth, which is a which is a, a, a sub variation of it, but a very important one. D may adopt a strategy of experiencing that is based on the will to participate in the linguistic game. So what does that mean? D experiences the world differently, more differently than C, A, and B. C and B experience the world more similarly, which allows them to go on developing the language and using it for communication. D starts to try to look at the world, to experience the world in a way that would be more similar to the way A, B, and C uh, look at the world in order to be able to become more and more of a part of the discursive uh, um, uh, process. And then something very, very radical happens in this process, and that is that the symbolic landscape, which is a, a tool for communication in this kind of situation, becomes a tool for learning, a tool for knowing. Okay, I look at the language that these people are speaking, and I start learning about the world through their language in order for me to be able to be more similar to them. Okay? Uh, when we get to talk about it again in a few lectures from now, I will claim that this is the basis of the, everything that is under the umbrella of the sapir worth hypothesis. That, that the idea that language influences the way we think is always a political idea. It is always about social relationships of this type. And one of the one of the ways one of the ways uh, that we can define freedom, social freedom, okay? One of the ways, again, many, many other issues involved. One of the ways that we can define the relationship between language and social freedom is uh, through the uh, capacity to experience privately not through the lenses of the symbolic landscape of your society. To the extent that you are allowed to experience privately and the language already is um, uh, suitable enough for you as a technology to communicate, this is a very good sign of social freedom, whereas situations where you have to adapt yourself to looking at the world through the lenses of the language that is not yours and is not suitable to your experiences, this is one way of thinking about situations where you don't have the freedom. A fifth 
A, a fourth uh, strategy, which is very important, B can pretend to do what we said before, to think about the world through the lens of the system, uh, of the linguistic system, but not actually do it. Okay? So, in a subversive way, learn to use the language as if he or she accept the, the model of the world that is in the symbolic landscape, but actually privately experience the world differently. Okay, so this is this is a uh, this is a strategy that is basically a lie. Okay, that is there in order to maintain your sense of say integrity or freedom in a situation where you have to use the language in a certain way um, uh, and so on. I think that one of the things that you see, for example, in situations where totalitarian regimes uh, develop. Um, a, a certain language, and you can only use the language in a certain way. Okay, uh, so you know the nomenclature of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union, for example, is the best example that we have. In a situation where a lot of people learn to use the symbolic landscape in a certain way and and communicate uh, using it. Okay, and get some kinds of very, very minute agreements between speaker and listeners about the way experiences that cannot be communicated are going to communi be communicated underground by using a symbolic landscape that is basically not your own. Okay, you have to use the languages in a certain, the language in a certain way, but you do not really uh, accept the worldview that, that is there, okay? So this is the fourth uh, uh, option. I have two minutes for the fifth one, uh, which is actually what, where, I wanted, where I wanted to get. Uh, D could actually stay and fight back. Assume that D would say, no, no, I'm sorry, you're developing a language that is good for you, and you're ignoring my experiences. I want the language to include my experiences too, okay? What is happening there, regardless of the issues of struggle and psychological issues and so on, there's something that is very important for the whole picture that I'm, I'm telling, that I'm, that I'm portraying here. If D insists, then the experiential, the collective experiential gap between the four uh, that the language has to be able to bridge is wider than the experiential gap that is only between these three. Okay? So between these three, because they have more similar experiences, there's an experiential gap at a certain level, and the language that they have developed is good for them. It is useful to bridge the smaller experiential gap. If D insists and wants also to be part of the development of the language, the experiential gap is going to, is going to be wider. The language is going, to be, is going to have to be more sophisticated. It will, have to be more, it will have to have more pieces of technology in order to bridge the wider experiential gap. Okay? So the last thing that I'm going to put on the board uh, uh, is, is this. Okay, uh, for the same amount of communicative success between the members of the community, okay, uh, the greater the experiential gap, the more you will have to, do, the more massive linguistic structure you will have to to develop. Okay, the less experiential gap, the less you will have to develop the the, the language. Okay, uh, situation where there is a communicative success at a different